It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Erickson Dickens. Hi, Erickson. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for coming on the show. Right off the bat, are you related to Charles? You know, I like to tell people I am um, because of, uh, you know, his name and whatnot. But unfortunately, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay. But you are an award-winning filmmaker, actor, and business owner co-founded Platinum Peak, Inc. Uh, what does uh, Platinum Correct. Peak, Inc. do? Yeah, so it's a video agency ran by my brother and myself. We started it back in college, uh, about 2016. Uh, we grew up loving making movies and filmmaking and whatnot. And when we got to college, we decided to turn that into a career path. And so we started off um, you know, doing anything and everything, trying to find a niche. And eventually we, we fine tuned our organization and we scaled it. And since then we've serviced, I think 32, we've serviced clients in over 32 States. So we do a lot of advertisements, recruitment videos, uh, branding videos. We, we really work hard to identify problems within businesses, sales teams, marketing teams, and operations teams. Um, and then we craft the video as a solution to that problem. Um, and then on the other side of things, we have another brand called Dickens Brothers, which focuses extensively on legacy documentaries for individuals, family offices, estates. Um, and so that's been a big focus of us as well, which allows us to really uh, embrace the more the storytelling, the filmmaking aspect of things. For the videos that you make for corporations, are they primarily made for the employees or for their clients, their their customers? They're, they they generally speaking they're more so for the company itself so for example if a company is having a difficult time generating more leads then we craft advertisements that can be placed inside their digital sales funnel um, if they're having a hard time recruiting qualified talent then we can make them a story driven recruitment video um, so it really depends case by case um, we have made in the past we've done training videos onboarding videos so if a company is recruiting or onboarding like a new client instead of you know, all the manpower and time it takes for somebody to actually have to do that, we've been able to make videos that have helped streamline that process and therefore saved the company time and energy. You mentioned legacy documentary. Is that the same thing as a biography? Essentially, yeah, yeah. It's, um, I mean, they're essentially tribute documentaries. So we've just really found that it's an inherent need, an inherent desire to be remembered, to pass along your values, to pass along the impact you've had, your life journey, your struggles, onto future generations. Um, actually, it initially started with a documentary that my brother and I did for our late father. He passed away when we were kids. And so we did a documentary on his life, which was essentially a biography. And that got our wheel spinning and we started to think about how we can replicate this process and implement it as another vertical within our business and sell it to other clients who might be interested in preserving either their legacy or the legacy of a loved one. And so for the past five, six years, we've, we've been really focusing a lot of time and energy on, on finding those types of clients who see the value in a type of offer like this. Are most of your clients uh, people making a film or who want to make a film about themselves or is it the uh, the kids or spouses of, of somebody who's died? So it can be both. We've had clients in the past where the main subject of the film has passed away and their their kids or their family or their estate want something to preserve who they were. And then we've had some clients in the past where the main subject is still alive and the family wants to capture him or her um, while they're still living. That way they have that, that documentation of them actually speaking themselves. Um, so it really depends. Like we've done projects in the past for primarily individuals. And then just for example, currently right now we're working on a 
long form documentary for a family foundation. So not only are we tracing the origins of this family foundation, the man who started it, but then we're also dissecting the actual foundation itself and the impact that it has um, on the community around it. These aren't necessarily famous people, though, right? They could just be ordinary people. No. They can be ordinary people. Whoever sees the value in this um, and whoever has a, you know, a, a budget, depending on the scope of the project, uh, we like to say uh, that these legacy documentaries don't discriminate. We'll work with people you know, from, from neighborhoods to boardrooms. It doesn't matter. Um, if you have a story that you want preserved and told, um, you know, we'll, we'll chat about it for sure. What do you use for media? Because a lot of people don't, you know, maybe more now than they used to, but a lot of people don't video their entire life. Correct. Yeah. So in the past with certain clients, we always say we hit the jackpot when we have found a client who has done a really good job with either taking lots of photos throughout the years or getting home videos or just old assets that we can utilize as B-roll. Um, but if that's not the case, then we have to get creative. So obviously in these documentaries, we do a lot of interviews, not just like with the main subject, but the people in their lives who can help propel the story forward. These can be friends, family members, business associates, um, whoever it might be. So we do a lot of interviews. And then in the past, we've utilized stock footage. Um, we have a, a library of stock footage that we've been able to utilize that has helped uh, supplement the interviews pretty well. Um, so if somebody's talking about you know, their childhood back in the, in the 1940s, um, and, you know, they don't have any video or content of that. We've been able to actually find stock footage um, in different libraries that we have and find something that is enough to be able to supplement that. And it turns out well. Well, I've seen some of those on YouTube, and it's interesting how they do it because, like you said, if they're talking about their childhood in the 40s, they'll have this sort of generic film of kids playing in a yard that with an mm -hmm. old 1940s car parked in the driveway or something. And, you know, it does kind of work, even though you know mm -hmm. it's not them, right? Exactly. It's, it's Yeah, and we've been able to, like, we, we'll use, like, um, you know, different effects, like putting a certain kind of filter on it so it makes it look old and nostalgic as well in certain cases. Um, but, you know, there's also that uh, the effort to not make it seem cheesy, right? You don't want to just put something in there just because it's old. You want it to somehow... Make sure that it's in line with the story. Um, we actually, we had a, one gentleman who we did a documentary for, and we did have to utilize a good amount of stock footage just because he didn't really have much uh, content of his older days and his younger days, I'm sorry. Um, but it was actually kind of funny because when we talked to him after he watched the film, he was like, for a minute, like, I thought that that was like footage of actually me or that was footage of, you know, the old roads that I used to take back in the day. Like, so, you know, it's, it, it's definitely, um, we put a lot of effort into when we select this type of stock footage B-roll to make sure that it's, it's not only passable, but to the point where you want to almost fool the person for a second so that they feel like that's actually, that was them, that was there. You know, the first time I remember seeing something like that was in that movie, with Michael Douglas, The Game. Do you remember that movie? Okay, yes. I saw it years ago. I saw, yes. Yeah, it came out like 1999, 2000, somewhere mm -hmm. in there. But they used something similar to that when they were doing flashbacks of him as a little kid with his father who commits suicide. And it wasn't them at all. It was just, I don't know who they were. But it mm -hmm. was, you know, it worked because they sort of made it look like 8 millimeter home movie or actually 16 probably back in those days mm -hmm. and you know made it yeah. real scratchy and you know that kind of strange color that they had back in the 40s and 50s right yeah there's so much cool stuff you can do too in post-production in terms of setting that setting the proper aesthetic whether that be with color grading or you know a type of filter or effect you use or a template um, so there's ways to make it work, and, and we've had a lot of fun actually throughout the past few years, like fine tuning that process. So I'm curious, what do you charge for something like this, or how do you charge? Sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, that's yeah. Um, so it really depends on the scope of the project. Like in the past, we've had some clients want more of a snapshot, 10 to 15 minute film, um, and then in the, in the past as well, we've had clients who have wanted a fully fleshed out two hour long film. Um, the three main variables we consider when we're quoting are, number one, the length of the, uh, the output, the length of the output, 
Number two, we consider how many shoot locations there's going to be. And then number three, we consider how many interview subjects there's going to be. So, for example, if we're just interviewing, say, five people as opposed to 25 people, that's much less time in the editing room, right? So it really does depend on the scope of the project, um, and it varies case by case. But generally speaking, they can range um, – I'm going to give you a big range here, but just to give you a general idea, they can range anywhere from 20, 25K all the way up to about – 300k and that it, it just it really does depend on h- how big of a project they're going for and then their allocated budget as well we like to say you know okay give us a rough estimate of what you can't afford or what, what is in your allocated budget and then we try to create something within that as well have you ever had people ask for like location shoots and big budget type things like that like oh we want to take this to london and shoot some of it there so not not out of the country, but uh, just actually in the past six months, we've been to we've been to Texas twice uh, for a project. We've been to North Carolina. Um, let's see, we went to Colorado. So it does take us all around the country, which has actually been really cool for us because we get to see a lot of new places and experience different experiences. Um, so yes, I mean the majority of these shoots are on site. We we that falls into the budget as well. So. There's no hidden fees or hidden expenses that arise. We The quote is all-encompassing, so when we give a quote, that covers everything from travel for us, lodging, food. Um, so there's no hidden fees that pop up and surprise people. So most of these, I would imagine, would be just done in the person's home or the, the kid's home if if the person, the subject, has passed away, yeah? Uh, a decent amount. Um, mm. We like to... We like to pick locations as well that help tell the story and almost turn the locations into a character in itself. Um, so yes, uh, to answer your question, some of the time it's in the person's house, but then sometimes we we try to find locations that are meaningful to the story. So for example, uh, about two months ago, we went out to North Carolina, um, uh, like the mount- mountain area. It's called Cherokee, very small community, and they have this really well-known outdoor play. Um, it's called Onto These Hills. And the reason why we went out there is because the subject of the film, that's where she met her husband at the time, way back in, oh gosh, I think it was the 1950s, I want to say. That's where she met her husband. And so we felt like that would be a very pivotal location to just help drive the story. Um, So we went out there and we filmed there and it was really meaningful and, you know, it, it helped evoke a lot of emotion in the person. So we try to pick locations that are not only convenient in a sense, but then also can tell the story well. Are you promoting something at the moment? Something specific? No, no, no. We don't have any special offers at the moment right now. Um, our primary focus right now is these legacy documentaries and um, just finding finding new people who are interested and, and continuing on. It's like it's our passion. Like we love telling stories about people, and that that stems from like an intrinsic motivation behind what we originally did for our dad. And so we've just continued on doing it. When people have these made, are they published or do they just keep them private for their own use? Yeah, that's a good question. So they have the the rights to them. Once they get it, we deliver it to them in a file. We also host it on our YouTube channel, our Vimeo channel. Um, and they can do whatever with it as they want. We've had some clients in the past who have wanted to keep it more inside the family, wanted to keep it within their circle. And then we've had some clients who have wanted to uh, share it and uh, leverage it in a certain sense. Like, for example, in the past, we've had some clients who have wanted a more of a 10 to 15 minute film so that they can share it with possible partners, attraction, uh, investor attraction, partnership opportunities. Um, and those are people who more so want to utilize this in more of the business set. So more of a, a practical use case as opposed to just uh, legacy preservation. So it's kind of twofold. How many have you done? We have, let me think here. Let's see. Seven. So not including the one that we did for our father, we have done seven now. Okay. Uh, well, I think, if is there anything else you want to bring up or are we going to wrap it up at this point? Sure. No, it's, um, I appreciate you having me on. I hope that gave listeners just a decent insight into the concept. And I want to I want to encourage people to having done this now for a while is to encourage people to reflect on their legacy, the people who are alive and make those, those daily steps every day to approach, approach the legacy that you want to leave behind. I feel like 
you know, we're only on earth once and we have this life and, um, yeah, make the best of it. Make, make the best of it, as cliche as that sounds. <laughs> okay. Uh, last question before we wrap it up. Do you have a website that you want to give out? I do. Yeah, yeah. You can uh, you can find us at uh, dickensbrothers.com. That is our legacy documentary website. And then you can also find us at platinumpeak.com. And peak is with two E's. Um, and that is more of our agency side of things. So advertisements, training videos, that type of stuff for businesses. Okay, so PlatinumPeak.com and DickensBrothers.com? Yep. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. This was interesting, and uh, best of luck with your work. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm.